I, like I said, man, when I had that part of my faith journey where I, I really made this definitive statement that I was frustrated with the way that Christianity was, was being talked about in the world and the way it was being activated. It was almost used as a weapon to harm folks. And then I began to read the long history of religion and the wars and the conflicts and even the genocides. And I've, I've really got frustrated and I had to really go and say that, you know, let me figure out for myself what is going on here. And so in the back of your mind, your dreams should be real, right? Thanks all for tuning in to Dreamcatchers, where we make things happen. Dreamcatchers was formally launched to unlock the hidden potential in successful, self-motivated individuals who desire to take their life's work to the next level but need support to evolve. We are a collective group of professionals with various backgrounds that use our talents to assist those individuals in realizing their wildest dreams by providing education, inspiration, and direction. This podcast is where we share the lessons we've learned along the way to catching our dreams and give you some context around the how and the why to each approach to put you further ahead on the journey to catching your dream. Are you ready? Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dream Catchers podcast. I'm your host, Jerome, and I've got the great pleasure of having Wesley Morris with me today. Wesley, how are things in Greensboro? Man, it's cool. I'm excited to be here with you today. I'm feeling uh, feeling great today. Greensboro uh, woke up with the sun shining, so I feel all right. So do me a favor and let the listeners know how they can get in contact with you. Yeah, you can hit me up at uh, Wesley J. Morris at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Facebook, Wesley Morris. And uh, yeah, man, let's just get in touch. I'd love to start a conversation. So you've taken the red pill, man. You've been to a powwow and hung out with the fellas. But, you know, before we dive into all of that, let's just talk a little bit about your background and so the listeners can get a feel for what you're doing and uh, what you've been up to. Absolutely. So I, I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm a Southerner. I am a um, close-knit family. That's where I come from. And I also grew up really big on community and friendship. And so uh, I'm the youngest of four. So I'm the youngest out of my, out of my crew, of my siblings. But um, really, man, I, I really grew up as a young kid who was, uh, had his imagination impacted by the early church. And growing up and, uh, in a faith-filled atmosphere, I was in the choir, I was the usher, I was all the, all the roles in the church. And so um, just growing up, man, I really enjoyed sports and uh, community, like I said. And I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to talk with you today because uh, as a young person, I, I think of reflection as being one of the most important gifts that we can give ourselves to reflect on the life that we've lived. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm also in my adulthood, I'm a pastor. I am a community organizer. I've been a chaplain in a hospital and uh, just various things, being in touch uh, with people right where they are and meeting them there and and seeing what comes of that. So there's very few people who actually go into the cloth, right? You're a man of the cloth. So talk to me how you created that life. Yeah, so I, I actually was impacted, like I said, from, from my home. I remember my mother preparing the music for the church. She was a minister of music. My father was a deacon. And I began to find my voice as I began to, to hear my pastor growing up. And I always thought, uh, I always thought Jesus was cool. I always thought that Jesus was that voice, that person who who came and and healed the sick and um, did all these wonderful things and had this kind of unconditional love that made um, the world a, a whole new world once he came. And so I was impacted by faith. But I like like many folks along their spiritual journey, I I, I had a point in time where I uh, took a step back. I, I said that I didn't have a problem with Jesus, but I had an issue with religion. And so I found myself taking that step and, and having to really search for myself and finding my voice. I, I really was impacted by how the church used the language through song, through praise, through prayer. And I feel that this language was really given to me. I felt like I was enculturated with this language, but I had to find my voice and that had to come from the inside out. And so in as much as I was given language, I had to really develop through my own experiences what my voice would sound like in that. And so my community supported me, affirmed me, 
And uh, you may have, uh, some of your listeners may have this experience when you, you do something and you might not feel like you've done it your best, but the elders come around and they'll say, well, that was a wonderful speech right there, or that was a really good job. And so I was part of a really encouraging community. And as a young person in, in high school, I was somebody who listened to others. I listened to other stories. I, I walked and talked with folks for a long time, for, for miles it would seem. But I would always be that person on the phone trying to help them figure their way out through life. And so folks turned to me for spiritual direction. And just after you know, a series of those experiences, I just found that being a, a spiritual gift that I had to be able to walk and talk with people through life and encourage them and to, in some way, try to represent a, a piece of heaven uh, on earth while you know, dealing with my own journey. And so I've uh, grown in, in many ways through my spiritual uh, and faith path. I've journeyed to other uh, spiritualities. I've learned a lot from my African past. I've learned a lot from traveling to other countries, the way others experience God in their own sense. And I think through those journeys, I've really been able to find a definitive voice for myself. Okay, so, you know, that you're touching with the taboo, man. You're committed to the cloth, but you have an issue with religion and you're going and exploring different countries. You didn't say this, but I know the story, right? So you're going to different countries and experiencing different ways of practice. Uh, come on, you got to break that out. How do you how yeah. do you reconcile the differences, man? You know, so for me, I like I said, man, when I had that part of my faith journey where I, I really made this definitive statement that I was frustrated with the way that Christianity was was being talked about in the world and the way it was being activated. It was almost used as a weapon to harm folks. And then I began to read the long history of religion and the wars and the conflicts and even the genocides. And I've, I've really got frustrated and I had to really go and say that, you know, let me figure out for myself what is going on here. And so when I read about Jesus of scripture, I found that Jesus had an issue with the religions of his day. He had an issue with some of the leaders of his time who, who really perverted um, the religion. And they took uh, what was meant to be an unconditional love and put conditions on it and lev leveraged those conditions to cause people to not love themselves. And they have to pay to love themselves. They have to do inordinate kinds of things to love themselves. And I just think that Jesus's testimony uh, to me was a liberating moment that said, look, you're in the world, you have a word, you have a message, and you can see the world around you. What in the world is broken? What in the world is suffering and hurting? And I found that for myself, Jesus gave meaning to the suffering that I saw around me. I heard a pastor say that suffering without meaning is despair, but suffering with meaning is destiny. And that stuck with me because I found that the suffering of the world as it uh, you can't just say a word. You can't just um, talk about it. Uh, there's a saying we have that what you see is what you get. <laughs> and that is not always true. And so we have to really live out and have a really true experience of God. We have to have a true experience in our difficult moments, our most trying times, the times and the, the moments in our lives that we feel are irredeemable. I feel like those are the very moments that religion is not meant to punish you. But I think the love of God is really meant to lift you and bring you out of those moments and remind you of your reality of being in touch with the divine. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. You said that thing, suffering with meaning is destiny. Uh, and let's talk about that, right? Because we live in a world that's about comfort. We want to be comfortable. We don't want that discomfort, man. So talk to me about suffering and what that actually is and why it's worth going through. Yeah, so I, I think that suffering uh, is part of the human experience, is part of the human condition. And my time as a chaplain, uh, I found a concentration of suffering in one place. And hearing those stories really began a process that started earlier in my life when I became a community organizer and began to, to be invited into some of the most difficult moments in people's lives. And I realized that we all have that. We all carry a certain amount of suffering and whether we're in denial about it or we dismiss it or try to go around it, 
uh, it does something to us. And for myself, when I approach this question of suffering with meaning, I think about all the uh, unearned suffering. That's a term I learned uh, from one of my teachers, Dr. James, all of Dr. James Cone, all of this unearned suffering, uh, it has to be redemptive in this life. And there has to be work done to explore it, feel it out, and to understand your wounds, or it will wound you. If we do not name what we uh, have gone through, if we don't, or if we're not able to find the language to express what is happening within us, then what is within us will capture us, and it will enslave us in some sense, and not allow us to live free in the moment. Suffering is the ongoing part of the pain, and when you feel that pain, if we do not address it, if we do not uh, heal the wounds of our culture, of our society, of our personal lives, of our friendships, of our relationships, it really goes on and it creates more of the same. And so we want to live in today. Now, we don't want to live in today under the name of yesterday. We really want to be alive for what is present for us. And I'm not saying that, that it's a perfect science. But what I am saying that is that we all endure a certain amount of suffering because we live in the world. And if we deny it or if we try to go around it, we will never heal or go through it in a way that can bring us out differently than when we go in. Okay. Okay. So you got to go through the pain. And so on your yeah. journey, you know, there had to be some people to help you carry your cross. So who showed up to help you arrive into this place that you're in now? Yeah. So I, I have a couple of uh, imprints that stick out to me. And uh, one came from when I was uh, a little bit younger and I had a faster car. And I uh, found myself getting tickets. My first ticket I ever got, um, I had been going well over the speed limit and I was um, really remorseful and sad about that. But when I turned around in the courtroom, my father was in the back. And when I saw that my father was there, that is one of the imprints that I keep with me, that I had a moment where I was beyond fear. <laughs> And beyond fear meant that I just was, was at a loss, but I looked and I saw that somebody was with me and somebody cared about me and somebody was gonna be with me um, on the other side of it. And so along with that, there have been uh, countless flashes. One of my mentors, Dr. Reverend Nelson Johnson, has stepped into my life and showed me, he was actually part of my understanding of religion and faith in a new way. Uh, seeing that God is a God of love and not uh, punishing me. Uh, for things that I might have done wrong and showed me uh, a different way to encounter this. And I would also say that recently, uh, you mentioned at the top of the show, the powwow came at such a critical moment in my life. I had questions of, of career, of relationship, of, of a future. And when I got to the end of my rope, the end of my own understanding, I realized, and I was really blessed by this, that there were other people around me. I had saw myself as a helper. I saw myself being the person to stand in for others. But when I needed somebody, I just saw that I began to pray. <laughs> I began to, to really hope. And I carried this around in me. And then I met you, Jerome. And I met others. And it just began to be a linkage that the universe was responding to me crying out for help. And crying out for help doesn't necessarily, it may look different for each person. But as long as you're able to say, I need help, um, that is a way to push back on despair. And I feel like fighting despair is actually part of my mission on earth. I want to fight despair for folks. I don't want us to suffer without me. I don't want our suffering to just be in vain. And so uh, the folks at the powwow, when we got to have activities together, we, we got vulnerable with one another, we opened up. And uh, like I said, and I'm not ashamed to say that there, there were tears flowing on the outside and on the inside, just to come to the realization that somebody else could understand me, or as we say, they could feel me, and um, we're able to get to um, the next part of our journey. So, I imagine that somewhere along the way, you've just, you, you had the question, should I keep going? You talked about yeah. struggles, you struck, talked about pain. At what point did you say, I've gotta keep going? I know it's easier to turn back, uh, you know, we call this the red pill moment. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, it, it's two moments collapsed into one, really, for me. Um, there was a moment where I, I got pretty low in, in my emotions, you know, and they say that you can't 
pour from an empty cup. And so I know that I was at a pretty low moment and I wrote down on a sheet of paper and I said, never give up on yourself ever again, comma, ever. <laughs> and I, I wrote that down and I tucked it away in a notebook. And so that is something that was with me. And then I had a, a, a trip um, to Belize and I was in a cave system with one of my, one of my really good friends. And uh, it was one of those trips that you, you might say, you know, I need to get out. I need to go somewhere. There's a lot going on in life. And uh, it just so happened that my friend was ready to take that journey. And we went to a cave system. And I remembered us waiting on those waters in an in a inner tube. And we were guided by a guy. There were six of us in our, in our group. And we got about a mile into the cave. And he asked us to shut our headlamps off. And when he shut the headlamps off, there was a, a kind of physicality to the darkness. There was a physical nature to the darkness. If you can imagine feeling the night if you are out walking at nighttime, it was that dark. And, and, I, and it wasn't a fear that came out of me. It actually was a deep comfort. It was like it was abiding with us. And the way that my mind was working, um, I was able to just, in that moment, settle down into myself, settle down, settle my spirit, calm myself. And I realized that darkness or, or fear was not meant uh, to overcome us. Uh, if anything, it was meant to alert us to something that is very important. And so when we left that cave system, I made a commitment to write about it. I made a commitment to talk about it. I made a commitment to share and, uh, and not give up. And so. As long, you know, it's a cycle. You know, we keep coming and wrapping around in life, but if it's a spiral staircase, that's different than going around on a circle on a flat space. You know, we might revisit some of the same spots in our life, but as we go up, uh, we're going, uh, as the song says, uh, every round goes higher and higher. And so there's a way in which we can experience uh, things that we may have in the past, but you can never step in the same river twice as the philosopher says. What's up, tribe? It's your host, Jerome. I just want to let you know that we put together a free 15-point checklist for exiting the matrix. Jump on over to dreamshouldbereal.com in order to pick your free copy up. Let's get back to the show. This isn't your first encounter with darkness. So oh, yeah. Dark, and let's talk about darkness. I mean, that was your thesis when you were coming out of school in New York. So let's talk about darkness. Yeah, so I uh, consider myself a dark-skinned uh, Black man, and I, I would say that uh, that experience growing up, I was always reminded of, of being dark. And I, uh, early on, I didn't wear it as a badge of, of joy. It actually was something that I, I got teased about, bullied about, and I thought about it in, in the context of what I learned about the world around me. Black and, and dark was just something that was bad or evil in, in some of its worst sense. And so there seemed to be this uh, idea that darkness uh, was equated with something that you do not want to be around, something that you do not want to explore, and they are emotions that are uh, not part of um, the positive in life. And so I, I would say that as I you know, grew up in this culture where uh, you could see dark music playing, and, and, and that would be an inscription of some horror film. Uh, or you see uh, in the culture that, you know, there, there's a, uh, how would you say it? There's a, a dark place. You know, these are things that you try to avoid in life. And so as I got to this point of writing my thesis, I became uh, to the point of frustration with it, really. And I said that, you know, I don't, I don't want to hate something that, I, that is so close to me and is always with me. Every day when the sun is shining, the, the shadows cast from trees, there are shadows cast from my own body. And so I don't want to, to turn away from these things. Let me look at it square in the face. And so I began to look in the scriptures and uh, I was writing my, my passage out of my chaplain experience and I titled it For the Love of Darkness. And I don't mean it in a uh, perverted sense. I really mean it to say that we need to learn in this society. We need to learn in our own personal lives to love the things that we feel are unlovable. We have people in our lives that have been discarded and marginalized. They are groups of folks who have been labeled. 
that uh, they are the ones that we stay away from. And these are the very people that Jesus and of the scripture went to, hung around, spent time with, and even considered himself to be a part of. And so I, I go by a couple of quotes that I think of. Uh, one is that uh, somebody said that if there's a lower class, I am in it. If there's a criminal element, I am of it. And as long as there's a soul in prison, I am not free. And there are, are ways that we, uh, that I would say that we would be better served if we go towards uh, the darkness, if we go towards those places. And so in writing, I wrote about language. I wrote about um, a dark faith, a dark hope, a dark love, a dark power that emerges out of when those things fail us, when our faith fails us, when our own sense of power fails us, when our hope fails us, and when language fails us, what emerges out of that is a darkness, a dark tenor uh, for the things that we sing in life. And so um, in, in view of me not stopping, because I could keep talking about darkness for a very long time, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and scale back. But I, I think that uh, what I wrote and what I came out of that um, whole process of writing is that there is a rupture in our society. There's a rupture in the world and it has been split between light and dark. And I'm just here to reconcile that difference and say that there's a radical possibility when we look at it that way. So on your journey, have you had any challenges or has it just kind of flowed nice and smoothly? Uh, we, uh, we, I think we talked about some of those challenges. I, um, like many folks have struggled with my own identity, my own self-identity, my worthiness, my uh, ability to do, uh, and the ability to, to figure out a problem. Um, those are challenges that I faced along the way. And when I've uh, found myself, I tend to take on a challenge. So taking on the, the role of uh, a pastor at a young age is something that I, I, I had to consider. I had to really think, am I ready for this? Um, is this something that uh, I, I feel called to do? And so there were some fears around that. But I, I would say that there's nothing like having a community around you. There's nothing like having folks who, who support your goal, your vision, and can uh, in some way help you see a part of yourself that you forget in those moments. And so what I would you know, say as a weakness or, or, or something that has been a challenge to me, um, those are things that I, I, I say that I keep close now. They, they are almost like an alarm system to wake me up and say, you know, this is something that shows up when you are fearful, but you don't have to lean or live into that fear. You actually have the opportunity to do otherwise. And that's the question uh, that I think the red pill always asks. What if this works out? What if something about this situation um, goes differently than your mind is telling you? And so overcoming those thoughts, overcoming those delinquencies, I think is a, a very uh, opportune time for us uh, as people trying to figure it out, trying to figure out the questions and, and deal with them. I was always told that uh, if you want a better answer, refine your question. And so ask better questions, ask more refined and, and, and questions that will uh, spur you to think beyond what you already know. So what was your first fear, worst fear in this process? And how'd you break through it? Man, uh, I think my worst fear, my worst fear, I think my worst fear is a fear that I, I can't get beyond myself, that I, that I will always have this limitation. And so I think my worst fear comes from that, that, one, that one phrase, are you good enough? Um, and that might be implanted by you know, some early childhood experiences, no matter how much goodness or, or things that affirm you, there's this kind of tape playing, like, you know, are you good enough? Are you worthy of all these opportunities and uh, things that you've done in your life? And so when facing that, I, I would say, yes, you are worthy. Yes, you are good enough. Uh, yes, you are who you are. And who you are is beautifully and wonderfully made. At our church, we have this part of our service where we, we look at each other, and now we have to do it over Zoom because of the COVID-19 situation. But we have to look at each other and we say, remind yourself and remind your neighbor of how beautiful and how important you are. Because... I remember the first time we did that activity as part of a training, uh, a dear sister raised her hand and said, you don't know how hard it was for me to do that. I want to thank you because it was hard for me not only to tell somebody else that they are beautiful, 
but to receive that I was beautiful. And that really impacted me and said that the only way to really help us, because we all struggle. There's a lot of us in that circle that struggle with that, but she just gave voice to it. We have to practice. We have to say to ourselves, you are beautiful. You are wonderfully made. And then when I remember having another practice, be gentle with yourself. I'm a, I used to consider myself an athlete. Didn't make it to the NBA. That was the route. But I used to play basketball. And when I missed a free throw, I was so hard on myself. I would uh, slap my hand, I, you know. But that summer, I remember, I just kept saying to myself, be gentle with yourself. And that was a phrase that began to turn the wheels on some of those old tapes, those old messages that I got from, uh, you know, just along the way of my journey, some of the uh, things that we all carry with us, you know, just by course of living. But the work to heal that is to really begin to do that self call that working it out. And so, yeah, you're beautiful. You're beautiful, bro. You're beautiful brother, Jerome. <laughs> and I think it's important that we're able to say that to each other. So you started being gentle with yourself. You started giving yourself that positive self-talk. And I've had this conversation recently where we've talked about how we're more generous and kind with people that we don't know than we are with the people in our household or the people that we live with every day, every minute of the day being ourselves. So I really appreciate that point that you just drew out. As you were going along the way, was there a point where everything was on the line? Did you hit rock bottom? Yeah, I, I think honestly the, the, at the powwow, right before the powwow, was, it was rock bottom and I needed, uh, honestly, I needed to, to have a, a re-engineering of what I um, thought I was a pop, what was possible for me, what I was able to do. Because it, I could think about things, I could, you know, dream of, but I needed to know that in my body was the capacity to do something different. And so when I was able to uh, like meet the fellas and, and have some of the conversations that we got to, um, it took me from uh, one of the moments, one of the, one of the very real moments um, where I did not think I could keep going. I did not think that I could, um, <laughs> I almost let go, and I, I keep thinking of songs as we, as we talk, but I almost let go. And uh, having that moment where brothers said, oh, not only have, can I feel you, but I've been in even deeper valleys than you've experienced, and you might even reach some. But the important thing is, is for you to know that it's not over, that that's not the end of your race. And out of all the great experiences that you've had in your life, those, those things are wonderful. It's great that you've traveled. It's great that you spoken to thousands of people. It's great that you've helped others improve their lives, but it's important for you to know the important thing is, is that you are a person, you have a human condition called feelings and emotions, and you are not uh, any different than anybody else. And so that, that brought me into a community of people and it brought me back to myself. Uh, and, and that was a, a really dope feeling to, um, to be with you all and then to go home knowing that man, I'm 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 in it. <laughs> you know, I got I got a tribe now. I reconnected with my folks. I reconnected with a base that I can go back to and, and that I can call and we can just kick it uh in, in what we created. Because we we did create. And out of valley experiences, I know that my faith teaches me that there's peace in the valley, there's a lily in the valley. But faith always needs a human touch. It always needs some reality and some experience that gives language, that gives words to fit what you feel. And I just want to say that again, that we have the right to feel, we have the right to go through experiences, mental, psychological, but we, we are benefited when others can give us words to help us express what we feel. And so that's part of what uh, I want to bring to the table and continue to do so. And the tribe is ever going, man. We, we had a, a random call maybe a month ago, and it was like we were in that same spirit where we met. So uh, I'm really grateful for that. So has there been anything that's tried to pull you back into that old space of, you know, not being gentle and just being rough with yourself? Oh, bro, that's real. That, I mean, that, that, that's as real as the weather outside. You know, and that's why uh, one of the, the writers I think of a lot, Howard Thurman, talks about an inner climate. We have to develop an inner climate and that we attract and we... Um, are able to climatize those around us. And so when we go outside, there is weather. 
you know, we talked a little bit earlier. I went for a run this morning. It was a little bit cold. And that was there. You know, that was there when I woke up. In as much as the things trying to pull me back, that's there. Um, but that is something. Those words, those experiences, they continually get healed the more I continue to choose differently. The more I lean into those experiences that came to tell me and remind me who I was, though, when I do that, the more I'm able to distance myself from those things. But we are all, like I say, I think vulnerable to the weather. And it, right, it rains on the just and the unjust. And so it's not a, a, a thing where um, you can do yourself right by, by making yourself good or I make myself good and I'm, I'm, I'm free of any concern or free of suffering now. It's actually the opposite. It's that I, I make myself more common. I make myself um, less virtuous in, in my mind uh, and become um, a human, become who I am, become and settle into um, the gift that I was given when I was born. And so when we are settled and we're at peace, and you can do this exercise, just breathe yourself back into a calm state. Doesn't matter what the weather is. Doesn't matter uh, what the thought or the memory is. Uh, you, you have to reconcile that day by day by trying to do your best uh, to feed yourself more of the positive more than the negative and try to do that for others. And you really get that when you, when you help somebody else. And you know, I think that you really get to push back on some of those things that would seek to pull you away from the present moment. Uh, by staying present to the needs and concerns of yourself and the needs and concerns of others. So now that you've outgrown your old way of life, what's your biggest, what's the biggest difference in your approach? The biggest difference in my approach, I, I think I would, I would lean back into to that, that word. What if it works? What, you know, what if, what if the possibility is, is attainable? Um, whereas uh, there was a moment where I just kind of wanted to, I used to drift and I used to get a lot of advantages. There would be great opportunities, but it seemed like I would be drifting into those things. But now by, by way of create, be creating, being creative, you can create opportunity. You can create the next chance. You can actually don't have to wait on it to come to you. Uh, I believe in being a creator now. I believe in um, being someone who, who works with others. Uh, in a way that supports a, a community of folks um, believing together. And so my approach now, like I said, uh, is, is one of, of peace. Um, it's more peace in my approach now. I understand that life has a, is the greatest teacher. And I think that as life comes, you, you learn to, to navigate it. You learn, it. you learn new ways, new skills. They say, if you've never had a rough seed, there would never be a skilled sailor. And so in some sense, I, I've become a more skilled sailor with much more to learn. Uh, and so I empty myself and I fill myself up with the day-to-day -day experiences. And so um, my approach now, like I said, is more peaceful, um, it's more accepting, and it's more allowing of life to show up while at the same time being very serious about the things I believe in. That's beautiful, man. Just absolutely beautiful. So what are you most grateful for? Now, that's every day. Make a list of 21 things that I'm grateful for. Um, and so I'm really grateful right now for my parents, man. Um, they're just on my mind a lot in this period where, uh, you know, so many people have felt loss and they felt um, the pain of, 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 of grief and grieving and when there's not many spaces for that. And I just wanna celebrate uh, my elders, um, not only my parents, but elders in my life who um, I'm really grateful for the stories they told me. I'm really grateful for all the prayers that they prayed uh, because I'm really, the, I'm really a prayer. I'm really a walking prayer. I, I know that I've been uh, cared for in, in so many ways. Uh, getting those stories now, uh, I've been in the habit of interviewing uh, my elders and interviewing and asking questions about how they dealt with different periods of their life and uh, four fundamental questions you know I asked them what was transformative why why and when and and how did it happen bring me into the scene of that part of your life and in doing that um, it's, it's, it's how you take gratitude and how you take great being grateful and making it into an action and so uh, I'm grateful for them I'm grateful for, for my elders and, and my parents on today, WJ and Carol Morris. 
the elders spoken like a true wise man i you get so much from them you don't have to relive the same things that they've been through wesley what dream are you most focused on catching next i have a dream of um lifting up and seeing the people when i say the people i mean the people um of the whole world uh really but those who have been most impacted by systems of oppression and systems of violence, those who have been um, most impacted by, by suffering in this world, to find meaning for their suffering, to find voice for their suffering, and to lift it up and to create a world that is already happening. I am reminded, and even right now, my first experience in, uh, in Cuba with a, a group that traveled there to support the solidarity of revolution, we asked a question. Uh, to a farmer and we said, how did this change happen? How did you create, you know, all of the, the new changes in this country? How in the world did folks get access to housing and healthcare and, and different things? But he told us um, that it was friendship and solidarity. And I take friendship and solidarity serious. And I think um, what I want to bring to this world is, is to be a hope. One of my teachers, uh, Cornel West says, be a hope. Don't just talk about it, but be the hope. And so my life is committed to being a voice for that. My life is committed to being uh, and bringing into being a world that is more just, fair, and uh, responds to the dignity, worth, and value of every single person. And so that's when we'll see the beloved community that uh, so many hope to see. And so um, that's me, man. I, I, I'm a voice for the people. I'm a voice for myself. I'm a voice for revolutionary love. I'm a voice for a kind of love that dips its toes in, in the in the things of this world and says that it's not over. Like you said, uh, it's not over and keep on going. It's a peaceful warrior. And so the final question is, what's the one thing you want people to take away from our talk today? I want people to take away that, uh, that they have a reason to hope. They have a reason to believe and that their suffering and the painful things in this life are not meant to, to harm them. Uh, and in many ways that we take with each other in community that we can heal. We have to heal through the things that have caused us hurt. And however that looks for you, I want you to take away uh, these words of healing, hope, peace, and joy, and power. And I think that we should do that uh, every day. And that's my hope, that against all hope, that we still hope. And when hope fails, we hope again. And so that's what I hope uh, we take away from today's talk. Wesley, I appreciate you being light in the darkness, my brother. This was a great, great, great episode. I really hope the listeners really pull out that pen and pad and scribble down some notes, man. Uh, appreciate you, and I look forward to deepening our relationship. We'll talk soon. No doubt. Thank you, bro. Thank you for joining the tribe today. We would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to rate, like, and share. Perhaps someone you know could benefit from what we've discussed. Until the next time, remember that your dreams should be real.